So, on behalf of the Dalhousie Feminist Legal Association and Outlaw Society, I'd like to welcome you and thank you all for coming out this evening on what's a pretty crappy day. So, good on you guys for coming. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on unceded Mi'kmaq territory and are grateful for the use of it tonight. I also want to point out that you are free to leave this room at any time during tonight's event. Women's washrooms are located outside of this door down the stairs uh, to the left and men's washrooms are located out this door down the stairs to the right. There are also gender neutral washrooms on the third and fourth floors and there's an elevator right outside this room. So tonight's event is a part of two speaker series. First of all, it's part of the queer and trans incarceration speaker series. So in an effort to ensure that all of our discussions remain intersectional, DFLAW has partnered with Outlaw to jointly organize this series. Outlaw is a network of LGBTIQQ2SA students and allies that are anti-oppressive, trans-inclusive, feminist, and social justice oriented. DFLAW and Outlaw are also grateful for the help of the South House Sexual and Gender Resource Center, who have generously supported our efforts in organizing this series. The next event in this speaker series will be held on Thursday, March 24th at 6 p.m. in room 104, which is just the room right below this one. And it will feature researcher Ryan Conrad, who will be traveling from Montreal to share his talk entitled American Injustice, A Queer Cautionary Tale. This talk provides a snapshot of scholarly and activist prison abolition work underway in the US and a strong cautionary warning against adopting the sometimes queer, sometimes feminist carceral logic of the US prison state. So please join us for that event as well, if you can make it. Secondly, the queer and trans incarceration talks are likewise born out of DFLA's larger annual speaker series entitled Your Feminist Legal Supplement. DFLA organizes talks as part of this series throughout the year to supplement our legal education with conversations about feminist issues. Our next event for this, spirit, this speaker series will be Tuesday, March 1st at 7 p.m. in room 105, so next Tuesday downstairs and the talk is entitled The Mechanics of Feminist Lawyering and will feature lawyers Nasha Nishawan and Kelly McMillan who will be interviewing uh, who will be interviewed by our own Joanna Erdman. They will be sharing with us their experiences of navigating the legal world as unapologetic feminists. Among other things they are currently involved in the reproductive justice litigation against the government of PEI. Finally today's discussion is entitled Queering the Carceral Landscape. GLBTQI Narratives of Justice and Imprisonment in Canada, presented by Professor Ardith Wynott. We are very excited to have her here with us this evening. After her discussion, we will also have time for a question period. So write down or remember any questions that you have and we can get to those at the end because we'd love to hear your thoughts. I would like to remind everyone that this is also a feminist space and we want to foster an environment of respect and compassion. In keeping with this, I ask that you please be respectful in asking questions and listening to each other. With that, I'd like to welcome Arden. Thanks, Steve. So before we begin, I'd like to thank you for braving the frigid monsoon to be here on a pretty awful night. So thank you and humble that you are here. Also, just a note, I'm going to be talking a little bit about issues related to self-harm, suicide, and sexual assault. Those of you who maybe have been to my workshops before know that I don't give a TW, but instead I'd like to say, if you feel things in this space, that's perfectly fine. If you need to leave, that's perfectly fine. Just don't leave alone and stay alone as you're feeling those things. Okay. So my goals are threefold this evening. I'd like to explore queerness as an embodied experience in Canadian prisons, both federal and provincial. And this includes the everyday experiences of queer and trans folks living in institutions, but also in their contact with police and their progress through the court system. But first, I would also like to consider the notion of queerness as a theoretical space in which we can reconsider the institution of law and our notions of security and violence. I hope that by briefly exploring queer theory and revisiting issues related to the gender binary, <clears throat> that we can undo some of the language and concepts that we often take for granted, especially when we talk about things like violence, harm, and trauma. And I think that by trying to undo the language around this and open it up a little bit, this will lead us to a better understanding of the social processes that render queer and trans people more vulnerable to effects of violence. 
finally, I'm going to talk about seven concrete ways in which I think we can forge a better movement for queer prison justice. So first, a few definitions. So I will be using the term queer to refer to sexual orientations and gender identities that don't conform to heterosexual and cisgender norms. At times I may say queer and trans, and I'm doing this not to say that the trans experience isn't inherently queer, I'm saying that out of respect and acknowledgement that trans histories were largely excluded in mainstream gay and lesbian rights movements for a long time, so it's just my form of linguistic reparation. I'm also going to be using the term justice. So I mean justice both in the institutional sense, but also in broader social senses. So when I use the term justice tonight, I urge you to think about it not only within your context of being emerging legal practitioners, but also what that term means in terms of your friendships, chosen kinships, and also your intimate relationships. I realize that most, if not all of you, are law students, unless you are concerned with details. <laughs> details, specific cases, dates, precedents, that's not what I'm going to talk about tonight. So I apologize if I'm not meeting your needs, but I do hope that by exploring these narratives through what I've come to learn in my own research, we can think conceptually. So let me explain briefly my own research background. So I have an interest in queer prison justice because I've been working in Canadian prisons since 2008. So I'm a sociologist with a background in literary and performance arts, and I came to work in prisons because I received a call from the warden of a federal women's facility out of the blue who asked me to come in and teach a poetry workshop. And the reason they thought I was the person for the job is because I'd been working with sex workers through Stepping Stone to deliver a creative way to talk about workplace safety when doing street-based sex work. And as in the way that the warden phrased it, she said, I need someone familiar with our population, which means women who are on methadone and have experienced trauma. I learned later that I was hired on contract with funds made available after the death of Ashley Smith. Um, raise your hand if you're familiar with the Ashley Smith case. Okay. So I was implicated in the prison industrial complex uh, because I was part of a PR move on behalf of the feds to make it look like they were providing programming in the maximum security unit and in segregation. So I worked for quite a few years with women in segregation and in the max unit and I work now in Dorchester Penitentiary in New Brunswick and I work with men serving lifelong sentences as well. Um, in terms of my research, what I'm interested in I'm interested in trauma and harm, and the ways in which the institution of law, and in some cases the institution of medicine, tend to perpetuate, exacerbate, or render invisible particular experiences of violence that we don't think about as violence. Okay, so that's what I'm interested in, and I approach justice from an emotional standpoint. So for the purposes of this talk, know that I am a prison abolitionist, and I'm not gonna go into that today because Ryan's gonna do a way better job than me of talking about that in March but know that I'm invested in transformative justice as a process that changes social conditions rather than using the punitive model of incarceration. So now you know my biases. Let's begin. We're in the max unit of a women's prison. Offenders are housed in two pods. Each one has room for four offenders. The pods are completely separate. They do this on purpose in case two women get into a fight so they can keep the pods as far apart as possible. The individual units within the pods are separated with cement block and plexiglass. The segregation unit is down another hallway, it's quite close. The doors in the seg unit are steel and they have a locked meal slot which is about big enough to put a tray or a notebook through. We meet in a room that serves double duty as a meeting space in a classroom. There's a shelf with what should be books but it's mostly fashion magazines that are donated by the correctional officers when they're done with them. And there are a few scattered tables and orange chairs, the same kind that you probably had in your high school. One wall is completely transparent. It's a plexiglass barrier that faces what looks like the front of a tractor trailer. It's the guard tower. So it's sort of a wraparound plexiglass space in which the guards sit, illuminated blue from all of the screens from surveillance feeds in the unit. So know that the unit has a lot of structure for a space that is pretty tiny and only really houses eight offenders at a time, plus maybe two in the seg unit if it's full. Inside the classroom there are six of us, 
five plus me. We're meeting to write poetry, review their homework, review their creative work, their drawings, and to think about creative ways to develop their writing and communication skills. So three of the five offenders that are in the room are queer. Two of them are in a relationship with each other, and one of them, I'm fairly certain, is someone who's on the trans spectrum, but they don't claim to be because they don't know what the trans spectrum is. They've never been introduced to thinking about gender identity in that way. All three of the queer offenders in my class are incarcerated for violent crimes that are drug related. All three have trauma histories. Two self-harm regularly. Forearms with scars, red and purple, from the wrist to the elbow. All three are struggling to get sober in a unit where security concerns make it really difficult for them to participate in programs that offenders in general population would have access to. So you need to have your security clearance at a certain level before you can be escorted by a guard down to participate in programs. The two women who are currently dating did not identify as queer before coming to prison. Both were raised in abusive religious homes, one in Labrador and one in St. John's, Newfoundland. In attempts to flee the violence of intergenerational abuse in their homes, they fled to different cities, and they made a living either in the drug trade or in sex work. One of the three queer women was sexually assaulted by her Oxycontin dealer for years and years until she was arrested and he was later arrested for those crimes. So I can see that their relationship together is tender. And queer love within the prison is something that's kind of beautiful because it is a space of violence and isolation. They support each other in their healing. One is being transferred soon to a facility in another province, and that's panic-inducing, and there have been a lot of tears. So although officially offenders aren't really permitted to have relationships with each other, certainly not sexual relationships, as long as nobody's having sex, breaking rules, or creating too much drama, in my experience, I see correctional officers turning a blind eye to this, and sort of letting the women, at least in the women's facility, have their relationships. Or scrapbooking. We're cutting out paper hearts and bits of brightly colored paper to give as poem gifts to send out in the mail. One is writing a love poem for her son, who's currently in foster care. One is writing a poem for her partner, who's sitting right next to her, and the Third, the most masculine, is writing a sex poem about a married woman she had an affair with before she robbed her house and fled from the cops. So all three of these women bear the physical and emotional scars of state, family, and intimate partner violence. They have all tried to self-soothe and heal with addiction. They have all come from chronically poor neighborhoods that are affected by colonization and the pressures of neoliberal global capitalism, which has gutted social services budgets at the municipal and provincial levels. In many ways, their stories, although they are queer stories, are not much different from the other heterosexual or cisgendered women in the prison. But if we play a numbers game, we can say with certainty that queer people are drastically overrepresented in the Canadian prison system. But despite this, queer and trans people are not officially counted as a minority population in official reports, say those from the prison ombudsman. Nor is there a strong movement here in Canada to interrogate and disrupt the processes that render queer and trans people more vulnerable to victimization and incarceration. So hold on to this point. Hold on to the idea of queer and trans folks being overrepresented and hold on to this idea that there's not really a conversation about that at the national level or in advocacy organizations. That's not to say there isn't really great activism going on in this area, because luckily there is. Okay, so let's take a bit of a theoretical and abstract detour. It's not a detour, maybe it's actually the center of what we're talking about right now. Who is taking a women's studies course? Raise your hand. Awesome, okay, we can speed through this. What is the gender binary? Anyone? What's the gender binary? I know this is basic stuff that we all know, but it's really, it's important, it's important to think about it and to name it in the room. What is the gender binary? The idea that there are two genders, male and female. Right. 
And what's their relationship to each other? They're opposites. Complete opposites. Okay, so what are those characteristics that we normally associate with masculinity? Strength. Strength. What else? Confidence. Confidence. What else? Power. Power. Right. What else? Maybe rationality. Strength. 